Hey there Cosmic Warriors and welcome back to another video and if you are new here my name is Hannah, I am a Western Practical Astrologer. Okay so following on from my most recent videos where I talked about the history of astrology, we explored traditional versus modern day astrology, we looked at even free will versus fiat all the videos uh, will be linked down below by the way. We are continuing on by exploring the origins of the zodiac signs. How did they come to be? And what were the myths and the stories behind them? Stay tuned and find out. But before we do dive into today's video, don't forget to subscribe, hit that like button and click the bell. And if you are interested in any of my services, if you're interested in booking a reading with me, then you can visit my website, hannahselsworth.com. There you can also find my practical astrology ebooks guide and merch. All the links to these products will be in the description box down below. I do hope that you find this video to be helpful today. Let's do this. Okay, so let's start off by exploring the heavens, the skies, the stars, which by the way, all sources that I use in this video today will be linked down below in the description box. As of today, there are 88 constellations. So since 1922, these are the constellations that made the list as being formally accepted constellations by the International Astronomical Union. And did you know that constellations are separated by their own boundaries? Of course, the boundaries are imaginary, but in 1928, the IAU adopted official constellation boundaries, which together cover the whole of the celestial, celestial sphere. Oh, and another thing, stars within the constellation boundary are considered to be part of that constellation by astronomers. Now, by definition, a constellation is a group of stars that appears to form a pattern or a picture. Take Leo, for example. Leo looks like a lion. The lion is the symbol of Leo in astrology. Take also Cancer. So Cancer looks like a crab and the symbol of Cancer is the crab in astrology. 12 ancient constellations belong to the zodiac which straddle the ecliptic and when turning our attention to stars themselves there are many many fixed stars that make up the constellations uh, there are said to be about six thousand stars that are visible to the naked eye under optimal conditions and the brightest of these stars, you might ask, Sirius. Yes, if you guessed that, you guessed correctly. Perhaps you have seen Sirius in the night sky whilst you've been out on your travels. I certainly have many times. I have actually mistaken it for Venus. <laughs> and apparently that's a common thing. <laughs> it gets mistaken for Venus a lot. Now Sirius is also known as the dog star or Sirius A. Now the name means glowing in Greek, which is quite cute, isn't it? Sirius is a binary star in the constellation Canis Major, which is Latin for the greater dog. And to find Sirius, follow the line of Orion's belt, um, belt stars downward toward the southeast. Other super bright stars though include Canopus, Canopus, and Alpha Centauri. Side note, here is something I discovered when looking into Sirius. Ever heard of the term dog days? No, not the song by Florence and the Machine, which is something that came to my mind when I saw the word uh, dog days, you know, the dog days are over. But for real, the term dog days refers to the hottest period of the year. And this period is from the 3rd of July until the 11th of August when Sirius rises and conjuncts the sun. And you've probably heard of Lion's Gate in astrology, okay? So the eight, eight Lion's Gate, where so many astrologers talk about manifesting and the opening of a portal, 
Well, this occurs during the Sirius Sun conjunction. Now, the Lion's Gate portal actually occurs between around about the 20th of July until the 12th of August, with the peak occurring on the 8th of August. Though it is kind of funny to consider the, the song, the actual song, uh, Dog Days Are Over by Florence and the Machine, because apparently um, this song is a reference to Sirius. Indeed, the fixed stars pack a punch. They make up the greater whole. And each of the fixed stars have their own significance. They play their own role. Now, I don't know anything about fixed stars, but an astrologer that I would recommend for learning about the fixed stars is Joe from Solar Systems. You can find Joe on Instagram and on YouTube. I will link his information down below, but he is very passionate about the fixed stars and their meanings and of their importance. But just to go over some things that I've been learning about to do with the fixed stars, a well-known fixed star um, that comes to my mind is Al Ghul. Al Ghul? Al Ghul. Al Ghul is currently at 26 degrees Taurus. And the thing about the fixed stars is they move very, very slowly. It takes about 72 years for the fixed stars to move one degree. Now, where have we heard this before? Remember, I talked about this period of time in the schools of astrology video, we discussed the precession of the equinoxes and how the earth moves slightly backward each year, moving one degree every 72 years or so. Yes, the fixed stars, they move one degree every 72 years because of the earth's wobble. And they also move due to diurnal motion, which accounts for the rising and setting of stars and the movement of the earth as it spins on its axis. And it was Greek astronomer Hipparchus who discovered the precession of the equinoxes. Refer back to the schools of astrology video. You can read all about the astrological ages as well in my astrology guide, which I definitely recommend. So just sort of curiosity, okay? I wanted to have a little peek, a little peek at a few of the fixed stars and how they show up in my chart. I selected Al Ghul. I also selected Regulus. So Al Ghul is at 26 degrees Taurus. And then Regulus right now is at zero degrees Virgo. So uh, Regulus actually went from 29 degrees Leo to zero degrees Virgo toward the end of 2011. Now I, I looked up Regulus and apparently it is associated with royalty, success and wealth and it can support our highest passions. Regulus is commonly known as, I will insert the words here, um, and it's from the Arabic phrase meaning the heart of the lion. However, the thing to keep in mind about fixed stars is that they are not um, super relevant unless you have like, according to some astrologers, you know, they, some would say unless you have a personal planet, unless they are very close to an angular house, an angular point rather within your chart. So looking the, at the AC, DC, IC, MC. Um, but then again, you get some astrologers who would even cancel out the planets as part of this. Think as well about the degrees or the orb. So the orb needs to be like one or two degrees um, wide. Anything, you know, outside of those degrees, a lot of astrologers wouldn't look at it or think of it as as significant. But then you could get other astrologers who could go further out. And then the other thing about this is looking at activations by transits and by progression. So that's something to keep into consideration. Though come to think about it, are you someone who was born when the sun was in Leo, right? At 29 degrees, so the last day of Leo season? Because if so, this could very well suggest, you know what, that the sun makes a conjunction to Regulus within your chart. It's the same degree even. Um, as Regulus. Your sun is the same degree as Regulus. But then even consider any planets you have at Leo at 29 degrees, or perhaps your rising sign is in Leo at 29 degrees. So there's that um, for you. Well, you see, if Regulus is well aspected, it's well supported in your chart, then this can invite much success for you. Um, your highest ambitions may very well be supported in this way. And then planets are also 
assigned to the stars. So in the case of Regulus, for instance, Jupiter and Mars. But then looking at Agul, Saturn and Jupiter. Though the last thing I just want to share when it comes to fixed stars is there is something known as the four royal stars. These stars are Aldebaran, Aldebaran, um, which is now at 10 degrees Gemini and is the brightest star within the constellation of Taurus. Then there's Regulus, which is now at zero degrees Virgo and is the brightest star within the constellation of Leo. And Titus, and Titus, which is now at 10 degrees Sagittarius and is the brightest star within the constellation of Scorpio. And then lastly, there is Fumal Hot, Fumal Fumalhawk, which is now at four degrees Pisces and is the brightest star within the constellation of Pisces. <laughs> they were regarded as the guardians of the sky uh, during the time of the Persian Empire in the area of modern day Iran. Aldebaran is the watcher of the east, Regulus is the watcher of the north, and Titus is the watcher of the west and Fumalhut is the watcher of the south. These fixed stars are said to be very fortunate and lucky when they are activated within your chart. But back to constellations, okay? Because there is a great video that I highly recommend by Royal Society, which I will link down below. Astronomy Writer. Ian Ridpath says that the latitude at which the constellations were invented was at minus 36 degrees north, which quickly, if you aren't sure what I mean by latitude, latitudes are horizontal lines that measure the distance of the north or south equator. And then longitudes are the vertical lines which measure the distance of the east or west of the prime meridian. Latitude and longitude lines basically help geographers and cartographers locate places on Earth. But yes, according to Ian Ridpath, constellations were invented at minus 36 degrees north. Lining up with where you guessed it, Mesopotamia. Yes, astrology was invented in Mesopotamia by the Babylonians. Constellations were then transmitted to the Greeks, then to the Egyptians, then to the Arabs, then they made their way to Western Europe as well as to India, and then the Chinese and the Mayans, they invented their own constellations and their own astronomical calendars. The constellations as well can be split into three major categories. There's the northern constellations comprised of constellations such as Draco, Ursa Minor, Ursa Major, and Pegasus. I love Pegasus, just love that name. I love Pegasus from Hercules. Then there are the southern constellations comprised of constellations such as Argo, Hydra, Orion, Canis Minor, and Canis Major. And then the final category you might ask, the zodiacal constellations, which consists of the 12 zodiac signs. Now, when looking at the size of the 12 zodiacal um, constellations, this information is actually taken from the sky.org. Virgo, I know, Virgo. Virgo is the largest, which really surprised me. Yes, Virgo is the largest and its brightest star is Speca. Then Aquarius is the second largest and its brightest star is Saddle Suit. Then Leo is the third largest, its brightest star is Regulus. And then it goes in this order, okay? The order continues. Pisces, Sagittarius, Taurus, Libra, Gemini, Cancer, Scorpius, Scorpio, Aries, Capricornus, Capricorn. So Virgo is the largest constellation of the bunch. And then Capricorn is the smallest. Interesting. And here's something else. You can find star clusters within the constellations. For example, the star cluster of Pleiades, okay, that is located within the constellation of Taurus. This is a star cluster that I love to look at at night. Have you ever seen it before? Though just to touch on Pleiades a moment, the star cluster, this star cluster is known as the Seven Sisters. 
it is an open star cluster and is among the nearest star clusters uh, to Earth. The nearest star cluster to Earth actually resides in Taurus as well and it is known as the Hyades. Hyades. In fact, there are more than 2,000 galaxies that reside within the Virgo cluster um, scattered in various sub-clusters. So speaking of Virgo, did you know Virgo and Scorpio used to be connected? Let me explain. So you know the claws of Scorpio and the scales of Libra? Yeah, so Libra was said to be known as the claws of Scorpius, the scorpion to people such as the poet Aratus. Two of the brightest stars in the Libra constellation are, I will just put their words here, I'll put their words here so you can see, but these were once the scorpion's claws. These words actually mean the northern claw and the southern claw, but then the claws were sort of cut off, if you will, to form Libra. And this change was made by the Romans who apparently associated skills with trade. However, do not get this mi mixed up because it was quite confusing to me as well, but the Babylonians, so before the Romans, they associated Libra with the judgment of the living and the dead, thinking about weighing um, the souls of the dead, even consider the ancient Egyptians who weighed the heart of the dead against the feather of Mat, who was the goddess of truth and justice. Also think about how Libra is associated with Lady Justice and Law. Libra rules the lower courts in astrology. Still, the Babylonians knew the constellation of Libra as, I will insert the word here, or the balance of heaven. But where does Virgo come into all of this? Okay, well, have you ever noticed how the symbols of Virgo and Scorpio are very, very similar? But the only difference is Virgo's symbol curls inward. Okay, it's sort of like the legs are being crossed. And then Scorpio's symbol, the, it points outward, okay, like a dagger. Well, Virgo and Scorpio used to be part of the same sign until Libra came along and sort of broke them up. Hi Libra. I'm kidding. Though Virgo and Scorpio, they are very much tied to the story of Persephone in Greek mythology. Persephone was the queen of the underworld and Hades was the god of the underworld. We will talk more about the sign's individual myths very, very soon. But Virgo and Scorpio essentially look at the journey of the soul into the underworld as well as the rebirth of the soul. And this is the thing about Western astrology. It is very much based on the seasons and the journey of the sun. Keep in mind that the sun rules your spirit. It rules your life force, your vitality. Western astrology is about following the path of the sun as well as the orbits of the other planets, of course. But each season brings a new landscape, a new kind of beauty, a new opportunity to develop and grow. So how did the 12 zodiacal constellations come to be? Remember this guy, Ptolemy? We talked about him in the recent videos, okay? Well, Greek astronomer Ptolemy, thank you, by the way, to the commenter who said that the P is silent, thank you. Ptolemy published the Almagest, Almagest, in which he identified 48 constellations. He identified the 12 zodiacal constellations, 21 constellations north of the zodiac, and 15 south of the zodiac. The Greeks spoke of their many legends and myths tied to the constellations. And then during Roman times, they were assigned Latin names. So you know how in astrology we like to talk about the Greek and Roman versions of the planets. So we would say something like Hermes is associated with Mercury, so that's Greek, but then Mercury is just called Mercury, Roman, or we would say Zeus is associated with Jupiter, but then, so that's Greek, but then Jupiter is just Jupiter for the Romans. I'll, yeah, I'll even just insert a little list here so you can see. Yes, the Romans got their constellations from the Greeks and they too would tell their many stories and myths about the stars and the planets above. Now, in modern times, the 48 constellations have changed over time before official constellation boundaries were set uh, throughout the 20th century, as I was saying at the beginning. So once upon a time, constellations were defined as star patterns but today they are defined as areas of the sky with borders. 
However, whilst Ptolemy catalogued the constellations, they were well known before him. Think back to Babylonia, ancient Egypt. During the Kassid rule over Babylonia, the Babylonian star catalogues were written. The earliest of these catalogues was three stars each. Another compendium of stars is the mul.apin. Um, this is the descendant of the three stars each list. And when it was reworked around 1000 BCE, many more constellations were included. But then later on, the catalogues reduced the constellations to 12. These constellations were then borrowed by the Egyptians and the Greeks. All this happened a full millennium before Ptolemy. So you can imagine just how ancient these works are. The positions of the planets were measured in degrees, minutes, and seconds relative to the positions of the constellations. Now, Alexander the Great's death in 323 BCE marked the start of the Hellenistic period. During the late Hellenistic period, countries in the Mediterranean basin region began practicing Hellenistic astrology. And by the fourth century BCE, the star catalogs reached the Greeks and around second century BCE, Babylonian astrology was mixed with Egyptian deacon astrology to create horoscopic astrology. And I also want to mention the Minoan civilization who would have been very much dependent on the stars to guide them, to use them as a type of celestial star path. Perhaps the stars helped them navigate their way throughout the Mediterranean, which by the way, the Minoan civilization was a Bronze Age culture, culture centered on the island of Crete. And interestingly, the largest Minoan palace in Kinos, Kinos was aligned with Speca. Like I said, the brightest star in the constellation of Virgo. So basically, the Minoan civilization traded with places like Egypt and Syria. And so perhaps they depended on the stars to help them get from A to B in their ships. Furthermore, the word astrology comes from the early Latin word astrolog astrologia, astrologia which comes from the Greek word for astron star and logia study of. Moreover, the word zodiac derives from the Latin word zodiacus, which comes from the Greek meaning circle of little animals. The zodiac is a belt of the heavens within about eight degrees north or south of the equator. And then when looking at Western astrology, the belt is divided into 12 equal divisions or signs each occupying 30 degrees of longitude. These signs of the zodiac correspond with the 12 constellations. And then according to the uh, world of antiquity, 420 BCE marks the earliest Babylonian reference to the zodiac. So whilst the Babylonians were studying the stars for many, many centuries, right? Perhaps it is assumed that the zodiac was not introduced until much later. But then you fast forward to Ptolemy once more. Well, you know how I said that Libra was once part of the Scorp of Scorpio's claws. According to Ptolemy, Libra was still called, um, I apologize for my pronunciation, but called Chil Chile, Chile, meaning pinchers. And the Romans refer to Libra as Libra, just not Ptolemy. Now, before I do close off, there are many other astronomers who discovered and named constellations during the Hellenistic period, including um, Homer, Homer, Homer and Hesiod, who mentioned the likes of Orion, the Great Bear, and the Pleiades in their works. And then according to Ian Redpath, astronomer Adoxus reputedly learned the constellations from priests in Egypt and actually introduced them to Greece. And Aratus named six individual stars, such as Capella and Sirius, 
Hello again. So this is just another session that I wanted to do. I wanted to add more information to this video. So here I am. Right. So I want to take you further back in time once again. Let's go back to Mesopotamia. And yes, watching it back over, I did not pronounce the A the first time, but yes, Mesopotamia. Let's take you back to the Sumerians. Situated in Mesopotamia, ancient Sumer was a collection of city-states. The capital of Sumer was the city of Ur. You are. Now, it was the Sumerians who were responsible for the earliest form of written language. They were advanced in the likes of writing, agriculture, science, and mathematics. They were one of the first groups to divide time into hours and minutes. And it is said that the Anunnaki were responsible for the fate of the Sumerians. I really, really wanted to share information about the Anunnaki today. So the author, um, Zachariah Sitchin, wrote a number of books proposing an explanation for humans' origins, which involved ancient astronauts. <laughs> oh yes, you guessed it, extraterrestrials. If I have lost you here, okay, that is fine, I get it. But if you're interested to hear more about what I want to share, stay tuned because me personally, this is why I wanted to include this. I find this so, so fascinating. This is actually information that I discovered years ago, but I did not know how to apply it to the information. Okay, so Sitchin proposed that the creation of the ancient Sumerian culture was down to the Anunnaki. And the Anunnaki are an alien race from the planet Nibiru. Now, Nibiru is a planet beyond Neptune, not to be confused with planet X, which is a hypothetical planet located beyond Pluto. Sitchin wrote about the planet Nibiru in one of his most unique works titled The Twelfth Planet. He says that Nibiru orbits the sun every 3,600 years. Now, the story here goes that the Anunnaki arrived on Earth um, 450,000 years ago looking for mainly gold. Okay, they were looking for minerals, but they were mainly looking for gold. Anu was the Nibiru leader who sent the colonists to Earth. And the mission was led by um, his... So, by, was led by Anu's two sons. These two sons were Inlil and Inki. Now, the Anunnaki also refer to Earth as Ki, and Ki was also the Earth goddess um, tied to the Sumerian region. Now, they chose the region of Mesopotamia, and what they did is they built this city named Eridu, which is believed to be the earliest city in southern Mesopotamia based on the Sumerian king list. Now the Anunnaki, the Anunnaki found much gold. They sent it back to Nibiru. However, a war ended up occurring between the Anunnaki and another alien race named the, I the Igiki. I think that's how it's pronounced. So the Anunnaki used the Igiki for their labor, but the Igiki had enough then the Anunnaki created a new race of living beings. So humans were created. Yes, I know. The thing is, is that the Anunnaki and humans, they became sexually involved. This was actually prohibited. They shouldn't have been doing that. But you see, from their DNA, new lines of humans were created who were actually much more intelligent than the previous generation. Now, there is a lot that happened, um, which I'm not really going to get into today. But basically, things got very much out of hand and the Anunnaki <clears throat> knew that floods and disasters were about to come to Earth because Nibiru was returning. Um, and so what they did is they returned. They returned to their planet, Nibiru. They fleed into space. 
And they also give humanity a chance to save itself by encouraging a human to build a ship. Who does this remind me of? Reminds me of Noah, you know, no Noah's Ark story. Anyway, and thus the earth was reborn. Though what really changed the civilization of Sumer was the creation of the first ancient empire of Mesopotamia, the Akkadian Empire. Under the rule of, of the Amorites, Babylon became the capital and the great empire of Babylonia was established. And then here enters the Babylonians, the inventors of astrology. They developed their own form of horoscopes and old Babylonian texts show um, celestial division. So dating as far back as 1800 BCE, but then some of the oldest recorded astrological tablets date back to 2400 BCE. But you see, according to some sources, the the Anunnaki were said to be stargate beings, okay? They could travel through space. They could travel through uh, space portals, right? And they were masters of the art of ascension. And so according to other sources, they state that the Anunnaki was sent to Earth to actually assist others in their soul's ascension. And I just, you know, I really wanted to touch on that because that's a different perspective. But to bring this back to astrology and the zodiac, the ancients associated the constellations with important historical and mythological events. They associated them with the creation of humanity. They assigned animals as symbols for the sky's journey and its movements. And according to the History Channel, the Sumerians identified Aquarius with a god named Inki, one of the sons of Anu, as previously mentioned. Inki is said to be the creator god in Sumerian tradition. It was Inki who came to Earth and created humanity. But how interesting is that to think that they identified Aquarius with this god and Aquarius is the sign of humanity in astrology. And I guess the other thing about this is Aquarius is strongly tied to cosmic downloads, okay? Universal truths. <laughs> and you notice this with many Aquarians. I mean, my son is an Aquarius. I have a lot of Aquarius energy and here I am talking about this. <laughs> Though, what about the myths the ancients assigned to the signs, you might ask. What stories did they tell? Because these stories matter, right? They matter when exploring astrology, especially when we consider how the signs represent different characteristics. Well, get this. Some suggest that the Sumerians were helped by the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki taught them, perhaps they taught them and passed on their knowledge, okay? And so, is it that the Anunnaki taught the Sumerians about astrology? And what I am saying here, of course, it has not been proven. The Sumerian texts even describe, they describe the Anunnaki inconsistently and they do not agree on what their divine function was. But um, I still think that this is something to consider, okay? It's a possibility. Though I also want to mention once more Hermes Trismegistus, who we talked about in the recent videos. So just to remind you though, Hermes was a mythological author and was one of the most significant sources for various um, alchemical, philosophical, esoteric, um, spiritual teachings, even looking at astrology, of course. He was the founder of Hermeticism and a teacher of astrology. Hermes was this Hellenistic figure that originated as this syncretic um, combination of the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Thoth. Yeah, he played a major role when it came to the development of astrology. So consider then what type of knowledge Hermes passed on. And Hermes actually did play a role then within astrology in this way. Still, what we are noticing when it comes to these past events is a common theme. And I think this common theme is tied to the deities, right? So deities, gods, kind of a big deal when looking at ancient astrology. The ancients looked to the Anunnaki, for example, right? 
And then the Babylonians, they believed their God's activities influenced their own lives. And here's another thing. Horoscopic astrology is significant to the Babylonians' beliefs. They associated the sun and moon and planets with their gods. Now, there is a tablet. I'll just put the words here, but this tablet shows the benefic and the malefic nature of the planets. We talk about benefics, we talk about malefics in astrology. Well, that's more Hellenistic astrology, I suppose, but even modern day astrologers would still talk about them. And benefic really highlights the good. And the malefic highlights the bad. And the Babylonians, they also divided the fixed stars into three groups, being the stars of Anu, the stars of Enlil, and then the stars of Ie. Ie. Again, looking at deities, gods here, okay? And you could say that gods and goddesses have existed in the human psyche since the beginning of time. Indeed, the Babylonians assigned gods to regions of the sky. They associated the gods with the stars and planets. However, however, I still wonder what stories did they tell when they talked about the 12 signs? What information did they, did they pass on? And what ancient knowledge did they transfer? You know, what, what knowledge was transferred from the Anunnaki to the Sumerians, for example? Then also, how much ancient knowledge and wisdom was lost. This is where we bring this video to a close as I announce a new series that is coming to Hannah's Elsewhere and we're going to be exploring the symbols and the mythology of the signs. So yeah, that is the new series to come. I hope you're looking forward to it and I hope that you find this video to be educational and helpful today. But basically that concludes my video all about the origins of the zodiac signs. Please do let me know if you find this video to be helpful. Did you learn something new? I would really appreciate your feedback. And like you, I am always learning. You can find all of the sources uh, here in the description box down below. Okay, so all of the sources that I used in this video. And as always, let me know your thoughts and your opinions on today's video. But with all that being said, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for subscribing. And of course, if you would like to see more videos from myself and you have not yet subscribed, then make sure that you click that subscribe button and also give this video a like if you do like it today. And I will be back with another video with a new series very, very soon.